Welcome everyone. It's, it's Wednesday. Uh, we're back to Australia for the birds today. So these are some rainbow lorikeets uh, chatting it up in an equally colorful tree. Uh, we have a pair of, of lorikeets that uh, are perhaps looking a little bit worse for wear plumage wise. And then we have perhaps the most dinosaur-like bird that you will encounter, uh, the giant cassowary of Australia, this big kind of horn on its head. And these things are absolutely massive. Uh, and they have these huge, uh, powerful claws. And uh, people, people do get hurt by, by messing with these things. Uh, you, you don't want to get that close. They are not friendly. All right, so one thing that I wanted to uh, talk about is since you have Lab Zero due tonight, uh, I wanted to talk about the uh, testing and uh, grading uh, part of the lab write-up. So every lab will have this testing advice section, which is uh, providing some guidance about how you can go about determining, like, is your code correct uh, or not. Um, a substantial portion of the, the grade for every lab, though not the entirety, will be based on uh, whether your code, in fact, does the, the thing that the, the lab has asked you to do. Um, so make sure to, to read the testing advice section, run your code, uh, uh, think about what you expect it to do uh, before you submit. Uh, to actually turn in the lab, you'll take the lab0.py file and upload that file directly to Moodle. And then also, uh, definitely a good idea to read the, the kind of uh, grading portion of, uh, of the lab um, before, uh, 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 before submitting. Um, and... Uh, it will outline kind of all the, the things that we'll, we'll actually be looking at for grading the lab. So um, you know that there's uh, part of it is, is you have assigned variables with appropriate names uh, for these problems, uh, that the text that you're printing out looks nice, explains what the number is, uh, has units where appropriate. Uh, and then there's this last piece, uh, good coding style, and we've talked about kind of not putting too much math on a single line, uh, but there's also coding style in terms of uh, putting spaces around equals and math operators. So uh, I want A plus B with a space on either side of the plus rather than A plus B all jammed together. Any questions on the, the rubric here or anything else about Lab Zero? Yeah. So for, uh, this is just a general question. Uh, for the first problem, you wanted us to run the three decimals, but for the other ones you didn't specify, did you also want us to run those or no? Uh, you do not need to round for the other problems. That's only for the first one. Yeah. If we did round for all of the problems, will and have already turned it in, is there an unlimited input or to? Uh, no, it's fine if you round it. Okay. Other questions? Questions about things besides Lab Zero? All right. As is tradition, uh, I guess in the in the week we've been doing this, we're going to begin with some some review, uh, and for that we will need our cards. So. Stacks of 1 through 12, 13 through 24, and 25 through 36 over there. So first one here, uh, we're importing square root from math uh, and uh, using it. And I'm wondering, uh, what is going to happen when I run this code? Is it going to print something? Uh, will there be an error? Uh, so. Uh, Take a minute and, and think about what what you expect this to do, uh, and then we'll we'll see what we're thinking. All right. So 
Some folks think there might be an error, some think uh, it's going to print out square root of different numbers. So go ahead and discuss with your, your neighbors uh, why you think it might do one thing in particular. All right, we're, we, we've had some, some movement toward uh, there will be an error. Uh, I expect uh, some of you have, have taken advantage of the computers in front of you to empirically determine uh, what, what's going to happen. Um, I want to show you another resource aside from VS Code uh, that we can use uh, less to run Python, but more to understand what, uh, what is happening there. So I'm going to go to pythontutor.com. And this is uh, a site. It's not just Python, but it was uh, originally that way. And we can type in uh, some code here. And then visualize execution and Python Tutor is going to let us step through one line of, of Python code at a time and it's going to show us a picture uh, of kind of what's going on inside the computer's memory as we go. So after we've done the from math import square root, it says that we have this imported square root function, which we would expect. Then we say square root equals square root of 81 and we have changed what square root labels in memory. That that same slot in memory that, that was our imported function, we've replaced it with 9.0. And then when we try and do this third, we get type error float object not callable. And that's because we that when we say square root parentheses square root, that's saying 9.0 parentheses 9.0, since we can see here that square root labels 9.0 in memory. And when we have syntax like this in Python, we've seen that when we put parentheses after something, uh, that's how we call or use a function. And this type error is saying, well, 9.0 isn't something we can use like we use a function. It's not callable is, is how Python is describing that. And the other part of this error message that's notable is that it calls this a float. It doesn't say, it doesn't say number, it says float. And this is because Python differentiates between numbers that are whole numbers, integers, and numbers that have decimal points, which it calls floating point numbers, or floats for short. F float is from the fact that the decimal point can move around um, rather than in a, in a fixed spot. So when we take the square root of 81, even though we get we, we, the square root of 81 is, is 9, it's not 9 point something, our square root function always is going to give us back one of these floats. So even if it's kind of a, a, a whole number, it's going to give us back this 9.0. And in Python, whenever we do arithmetic that involves one of these floats, one of these numbers that has a, a point something, the result will always also be a float. Most of the time, we do not have to worry uh, about floats versus uh, integers. Um, in, in the, the old days of Python, they made a mistake and made it so you did have to always be thinking about it. Uh, they realized this was, was bad, caused a lot of problems, and, and uh, newer versions of Python um, sort of uh, will, will trip us up a lot less on that. All right, what are your questions about, about this example? Yes? So you would define float as numbers that have decimal points that can move around, right? Yes, I would. Uh, there, there are numbers that will always be displayed with like point something. Yeah. Yes. I kind of thought there would be an error because I thought it should be math squirt eighty one. Do we not need that um, for this one? That's that's a good point. This is our difference between.
import math versus from math import square root. That in this first case, we would have to write math.square root. In this second case, this different way of importing, we can just write square root. Uh, and so here we actually see one of the reasons why even though we have to like type more characters in this first version, it can potentially avoid like a whoopsie where we overwrite something that we imported. Because we're never going to have a variable named math.square root, so we can't possibly uh, uh, overwrite that. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry? Uh, if we wanted to uh, have this uh, work without an error, we would just want to not name our variable the same thing as a function that we're also trying to use. So maybe I can name it v, or I could spell it out, square root, square root, and then I have two separate variables, sqrt, the thing that I imported, and then this other variable that I named square root, uh, and then that will, will print out square root equals 3.0. Other questions? All right, next exercise. So here I have four lines. Uh, they are numbered. And I'm asking you to determine how you would put these lines in order uh, to actually print out uh, the area of uh, this circle um, uh, where r is the, the radius of the circle. So we're a uh, big majority on answer D. Uh, we would do three, then four, uh, then two, then one. Uh, that is uh, indeed what we'll want to do. Uh, can I get a volunteer to explain kind of how you thought about putting these lines in order? Yeah. Um, well, line three first, because we're using math.py, which is a function called the math module. So we've got to get math first. Um, then we uh, define R in line four. Uh, because we don't want to use R in line two before it's defined. So we define R first, then go to line two where we define area using R and then print the result from there. That's exactly right. Um, questions on, on this example? Yes? Is, is, uh, I was wondering if one thing you want to know is possible, is it uh, just about uh, like Thing that the import statement is always the first line, or can that be moved around? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 4, 3, 2, 1 would run, would still print out what we want. Um, good coding style is you put all imports up at the top so that you can, there's like one place that you know to like go and, and look for them. But yes, uh, all that we need is to import it sometime before we use it. Other questions? All right, one more. So in the previous example, uh, I used r star star 2 to write r squared in Python for the, the area of a circle pi times the radius squared. So we have this function, pow, short for power, uh, that's part of the math module. And so I'd like you to look at the, the documentation for the, the POW function here uh, and select the answer uh, for using math.pow in that line to compute the area. All right. So mostly we're thinking C. Uh, I'd like you to take a minute and discuss with your neighbors how you use the documentation to figure out what the the line of Python you chose should be. All right. 
So in this in this case, our uh, our majority uh, is correct that we'd use uh, math dot pow of r first and then two to get r raised to the power of two. Um, reading documentation like this uh, to figure out how how different Python things work is is something that will will be very useful throughout the term. Uh, you might also be wondering. Well, if we had this star star two, why do we also need this math.pow? You might further ask, why do we also need a built-in function pow that's not part of the math module, but that also does this, this same thing? Uh, the answer is that when creating a programming language, it's usually not created like all at once. Python has, has been around for decades, and different parts of it were added at different times. And so you will, you will find it very often that a programming language will have kind of multiple ways uh, to do a particular thing, because there was initially, say, one way, and then there was some person or group of people that wanted something that was very slightly different than the one that was in there. And they convinced enough people that there should be a second way added to do this thing that was slightly different. So, uh, well, this is not, not the last time we'll, we'll see an example of that. Uh, what are your questions on, on math.pow in this example? All right, so that will do it for our review. And so now on to, uh, as I promised on Monday, uh, we would talk about uh, what actually, uh, in more detail, what is a function, how do we make our own. And so uh, this goes back to sort of the mystery that we've had ever since we started trying to make uh, a program do something about uh, uh, the weather, which is get per temp was this mysterious, with these parentheses, was this mysterious incantation uh, that we were using to, to get a number for the current temperature. And this is, in fact, uh, a function that uh, I defined in a file called temperature.py. Uh, that, uh, that that we've been using. So why should uh, current temperature incorporated have all the fun? We should get to, to make our own functions. Um, and one thing that uh, came up in the very first day was we had some set of steps, in my case, uh, for writing down the letter A. And this was a, a set of steps that I wanted to do kind of multiple times or in different places. Uh, and so kind of gave this set of steps an, a name that I could use to just say like, okay, do all the steps that are that it takes to, to write an A. And so we could do uh, the same thing for say uh, something that we might do uh, uh, a lot in our weather program, which is convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Like we, we know how to write the, the, the Python code to do that conversion, uh, but we can also turn it into a function. So functions uh, are, uh, is another term that computer scientists borrowed from math to mean something uh, mostly unrelated to what uh, uh, you'll see it used in, for in math class here. The uh, main role of a function is to separate defining some sequence of steps and actually doing those sequence of steps, which is what I mean by execution. So we're going to take the, the defining part first. And whenever we define a function, it starts off the same way with the special word uh, def, def. Then uh, 
we give the function a name. So a name like square root or get per temp. And then in parentheses, after the name, we define what are the inputs to this function. As we've seen get per temp, a function that requires no inputs, we've seen square root, a function that requires one input. Uh, we've seen math.pow, a function that requires two inputs. And so when we're defining a function, we also need to define uh, what these inputs are. And the kind of computer science terminology for these inputs is parameter. And so in these parentheses, we'd have, say, parameter 1 and parameter 2. This comma separated list of, of parameters can be anywhere from 0 to as many as we want. So in this example, I'm, I'm doing two. And then at the end of this, we have a colon. And colons are, uh, are going to, we're going to use them a lot as sort of like a way to signal the beginning of some kind of set of steps. So in this case, they're beginning the set of steps that's uh, inside our function. And then to actually define the steps inside of the function, we have some lines of Python that are indented, like some number of, uh, of spaces, usually four, in from where our, our def is. And then we have some steps that, that this function involves. And then once we see some line of code that's not indented, that is like now the end of the, the steps in, in our function and um, uh, signals uh, that, that we're kind of now writing code that's outside the function. So if I were to kind of take this general picture and turn it into specifically I want a function that converts uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius, I might say right, def, I'm going to call it f to c. It's going to take in one parameter, a temperature in Fahrenheit. I have my colon, and then I have the steps in the program or, or the function, which are you know to do to do our math. Step F minus thirty-two times five divided by nine. So now we have a function that can take in an input and do some, do some math for us. However, one crucial thing about functions Functions are their own little worlds, meaning that what we do inside a function stays inside that function unless we actually give the computer an instruction to send something out of the function. So we've seen uh, uh, one way to like send something from our program outside of it. Uh, what 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 is that? Print. Yeah, print. We we've seen that print can send some some piece of our program to the screen, right? Print doesn't send something to somewhere else in our program where we can use it. It sends it like outside the program to the screen. So we'll we'll have a new uh, a, a new in, uh, in, instruction in Python that says send this piece of information from inside the function to where that function is used in the program. So this is not sending it outside the program, but just outside the function. And that word is return. 
So this kind of completes uh, uh, the definition of our, our f to c function. All right. Ask me questions about this. Yes? So can things from outside the function go into the function world, like you can reference a variable from outside the function and use it in your definition? That is, that is an excellent question. Uh, and so to answer that, I am going to give you Aaron's function manifesto. Number one in the manifesto. Functions should only operate, should only do stuff with things that are parameters to that function or variables that we defined inside the function. So yes, it is possible to have a function do stuff with variables defined outside. No, I'm not going to tell you how to do that because it's a bad idea and you shouldn't. <laughs> All right, item number two in my manifesto, You should, write fun you should always write functions that have a return with some sort of value. And this is because if I had, and, and I'll, I'll show what this looks like in a moment, but if I had forgotten this return, uh, this function just like wouldn't work. It would not do what, what I wanted it to do. And so as we're getting used to writing functions, this is an important rule to keep in mind. We're never going to be writing functions uh, that aren't producing some result. Yes? Can you explain what the return value does? Yes. So this special instruction return it does uh, two things from within inside, uh, from inside the function. Uh, one, which I haven't mentioned yet, is it ends the function, meaning that in my f to c function, if I had something here after this return that said print hello, hello would never be printed. Because once we get to a return, that ends the function. We're not doing, we're, we're not doing anything else inside the function. The second thing that the return does gets at what, the, what I mean by uh, return value, and that is that return sets the value that a function call of that function will have. So uh, to, to illustrate that, I will switch over to VS Code. So here's our... Uh, uh, weather.py uh, that we've been working with. And what I will do is put my conversion function in here. And then I, to use the function, as we've seen before, I will have the function name followed by parentheses, and inside that parentheses I will provide the, the parameters, I will provide the inputs. So my hot temp C equals F to C of my hot temp. So 
this is what I mean by sets the value of the function call, is that whatever comes after this return is what this function call to this function, that is the value that it will have. So uh, I could uh, test this out by saying, you know, print uh, f to c of uh, 50 and 60 and 70. And each time I call this function, it will go to that function and, and do the steps that I've defined inside of it. And then we, when we get to the return, we have whatever value comes after the return. That's what the function call will, that's the value it will have once the function returns. So if I run this, I see that I have 10, then 15, 0.5, then 21, 0.1. Now, each time I'm calling this, this function, I'm providing a different input. It's going into, into the steps that I defined inside the function, and then the return is saying, okay, here's the value that that function call is going to have. Yeah? So when you put in those numbers, what the computer is saying is also temp f equals 50, temp f equals 60? That's, that's a great point. That, these parameters uh, are both defining like how many inputs uh, the function is going to have and also the label that those inputs will have inside the function. So yes, uh, when uh, on line 10, we're going to go into the function where temp f is 50, and then when we get to line uh, 11, we go into the function where temp f is, is 60 and, and so on. Yes. I'm kind of confused what the difference between a parameter and a variable is. So, uh, a, param uh, a way to think of this is a parameter is a particular kind of variable that exists only inside some specific function. So, this temp f says this is a variable that exists inside this function, and it is going to be the label for the first, and in this case only, thing that I input into a, into a function call. Which means, and this goes back to functions of their own little worlds, if I try and print out temp f outside the function, I get a name error. Because temp f is a variable that exists only inside the function. So that's the main distinction between a variable, uh, something that I kind of declare with a, like, cur temp equals something, versus a parameter, which it appears in this function definition and which gets a value when that function is called. Does that make sense? What are your other questions? Yes. If you were to name or like define temp f outside of the function, would it still work when you call it back in? Good question. So, what if I had uh, temp f equals five here, and then I print temp f down here? This goes to functions of their own little worlds. The temp f inside the function is just that. It's a version, of, it's a, it's a uh, variable called tempf that only exists inside the function and is disconnected from the outside world. So this tempf equals 5 does not change. We still print it out as 5 when we get down here. And so you actually have to kind of do some extra work to, to violate uh, tenant 1 of, of my manifesto. Yes? So say we put like uh, a formula inside the function and it has multiple parameters, would we have to define each of the parameters before we put it? Uh, th yes, that, that, that's exactly right. That if, uh, if this function had uh, 
A and B and A and, and B were part of this, uh, this formula, yeah, we would have to, uh, all the, the variables that we want to use inside the function, we either have to like declare that variable inside the function or it has to be a parameter. Yeah. Uh, whatever is again. Yes, so the reason that uh, this line works for me is that I have a file called temperature.py in the same folder. And now the, the curtain is lifting up and you see the, the, the Wizard of Oz where our get current temperature, you know, I just wrote a function that returns the number I wanted. So you can imagine that this get current temp is doing something fancy where it's like talking to weather satellites and getting the temperature. Uh, but in, uh, in reality, I wrote a little function returns 28. And then as long as my temperature.py is in the same folder where my other Python files are, so uh, it's a little small, but both my weather version 2.py and temperature.py, they're in the same folder. And so then I can import the get curve temp function like from one Python file to the other. So this, uh, this code wouldn't work for you uh, unless you also had temperature.py or, or instead of this, uh, this import, uh, wrote your own uh, uh, get curve temp function. Yeah. Um, Kind of a question that this just reminds me of this more about VS Code in general. Um, how would you make like a separate workspace slash is that something that we should be concerned to do right now? Um, so I would not worry about that for now. Um, so one, uh, the one thing I will say is that uh, on Mac, it's just file open. On a Windows, you'll have both open and open folder. Open folder is the, the, uh, the one that's relevant here. Uh, and my advice would be to do each lab or each kind of Python project in its own folder and then have that folder open in VS Code. Uh, that, uh, uh, particularly if there are, um, uh, uh, particularly if you have kind of multiple products that maybe involve files with similar names and, and things, there's um, kind of keeping things in, in their own folder can be a nice way to, to organize that. Other questions? All right, so uh, let's do a quick check. So I would like for you to I would like you to write a function to compute the area of a circle. And to, to get you started, we begin the function with def, call this function area, and it would take in one parameter that is the radius of the circle. And so then, indented inside here would be the steps to compute the area and you would want to make sure that we're following both of these both of these principles including having a return and then i would like you to use the function to print the area of a circle with a radius of 10. So uh, work with your neighbors to figure out how you would write uh, the, this function and then uh, use it 
to, to print the area. All right, so sorry to cut you off. Uh, hearing lots of good uh, discussion about how to how to approach this this function. Uh, can I get a suggestion of a, a line of Python to add to to what I have up here? Yes. You may want to import math. Yes, I like math. Import math. Uh, what else? Yeah. Actually calculate the area in the function. I, I like that idea. How 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 would you calculate the area? Uh, well, area of circles pi r squared. Uh, so first you're going to need that pi, and then multiply by r, which you already had as the input, and then to the power of two. Yep. So we're pi r squared, we have our, our area. Uh, what's something else I could could add here? Yes? A return. Yes, I would want to return in my function. That, that's, that's in my manifesto. I'd better, better follow it. Uh, where would I put the return? I would put it before math.pi. So return math.pi times r squared. That's going to end my function. That's going to set my the, the value that I have. I think this is probably all I'll need. Yeah. So uh, I uh, could put uh, you mean like parentheses around like that? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, doing this will will not change the program at all. Uh, it's not required that I put parentheses around the return value. Uh, but yeah, this, this will work great. Um, how would I use this function to like, get the area of, of a circle with radius 10? You just have to like print like a um, area with the parameter as ten. Like that. All right. Let's see. Prints out uh, three hundred and fourteen. If I think area ten squared is a hundred times three point one four. All right, this seems like you know what I would expect for, for the area of a circle of, of radius 10. Um, yeah, so I think this, this, will, this will be what we, we need to both define a function and then, and then use it. Uh, what questions do you have about this? All right, so we have our uh, uh, function here uh, to convert uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius, uh, but I've uh, been talking about from day one, uh, let's get a computer to, to make a decision, to like do something uh, that depends on some input that it's, it's getting. Uh, and so, uh, we start out with, let's get a weather app to display an icon that depends on the, the state of the current weather. Simplify that to, let's have a computer decide whether to display the text in red if it's hot. And as we've gotten as far as computing the difference between the current temperature and some, some hot temperature, but now we're, we're finally getting to the point where we're going to have a computer make a decision and uh, we can uh, do this using Python's if, if. And the way that this is going to work is we're going to say if and then some condition, something that uh, uh, can in this case be true or false. We're going to have a colon like we had with our function definition. 
And like with the function definition, we're then going to have an indent. And then we're going to have some code inside the if where this thing that I'm printing inside the if, it's only going to print out uh, if this condition here is capital T true. And when I have an unindented line, after the if, that's going to be something that's always going to happen. So this is this is maybe a, a good start. We still have this like mystery. What is this condition? Um, but before I get to that, uh, in this kind of motivating uh, this thing that has been motivating us, can we display text in red if it's hot or uh, uh, black if it's if it's cooler than that? Well, we need the computer to actually be able to take different paths to do one thing in some case and another thing in some other case. So there's a nice way to express this in Python using a combination of if and this special word else. where we have if, and then uh, a condition, and we have something inside the if that, we, that will happen only when that condition is true, and then we have this course, this sort of matching else, and something that will happen only if the condition is false. So this will give us a way to have the computer take kind of one of two different paths. Like it either goes and does the thing inside the if or the thing inside the else, since the can condition can't be both true and false at the same time. So what is this condition? How do we make something that's either true uh, or false? So for this, We're going to use something called a Boolean expression. And a way I like to think about Boolean expressions is that they're a, a, a kind of special kind of math where the result is either true or false. So, uh, so like this is a, an operation we can send to our, our CPU uh, that, that's going to, to kind of compute as, as true or false. So we can say uh, 7 less than 3. This would be a Boolean expression. Less than is something that's true or false. And in this case, it, it would be false. 7 is, is not less than 3. So we have uh, less than, less than, or equal to, greater than, greater than, or equal to, that we can have kind of some, some value on the left, some value on the right, and we compare them. Now, we also want to be able to do equal, but if I have two variables, A and B, I do A equals B in Python. Does this already mean something? Yeah, yeah we're, kind of, we're, already, like, we're already using this equals to mean the assignment operation. So we're sort of out of luck if we want to use it to also see if two things are, are, are equal. So the designers of, of Python who, who just took this from, from earlier programming languages and all their wisdom said, well, we'll just put two equals next to each other. And that's how we'll express like two things being being equal. So instead we would say A equals equals B. And this would be true when A and B have the same value, false if they have different values. 
as you might imagine, having one operation with one equals and another with two, it's very easy to forget the second equals. Uh, so when, uh, when you are, are working with these Boolean expressions and there's some weird error on a line where you're checking if two things are equal, good idea to be like, wait, did I forget one of the equals? We can also say exclamation point equals for not equal. So with these operators, we can uh, say fill in this uh, condition with some, some expression, let's say uh, hot temp, uh, rather cur temp uh, greater than hot temp C. Right, now we have, uh, is our current temperature greater than our, our hot temperature in Celsius, true or false? This, we can now express this um, uh, condition that where we want the, the program to do, to do different things. So now it comes to the part, well, I said we want the program to print text in red if it's hot. So I didn't know how to do this just off the top of my head. So I went to Dr. Google and I said Python uh, print red text. And I saw there's a, a Stack Overflow post about this. And I read through the various advice. I said, hmm, this one, this one looks interesting. And I copied the link to this post and left a comment in the code, colored text from that URL. And then I used the advice there to say the current Temperature is backslash x one b bracket one semicolon thirty one forty m. You can see why I didn't remember this off the top of my head. Uh, per temp, and then backslash x one b bracket zero m degrees Celsius. And then I want this same thing if the condition is false, just without this stuff to color the text. So let's see if this will print. Ah, I made this have A and B, which I didn't actually want. And there we go, we get the text printing out in red. When it's hot, I can say, well, what if I raise the, the threshold for when it's hot? Doesn't print out in red. We did it. We made a computer print different colored text based on the temperature. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. What are your questions about uh, Booleans, if else, that kind of made, made this work? Yes? I was just wondering, um, if you wanted to make like the uh, requirement of the condition that a certain number is even or odd, um, how would you go about it? That's, that's an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, problem. I would say the most common way to do even or odd is if we say x remainder when we divide by 2. It's going to be 0 if it's even, 1 if it's odd. So x remainder 2 equals 0 would be true when x is even. Yes? So are capital P true and capital F false things that you don't want to write into like your if and else statements because 
Yes, yeah, so capital T true and false are things that we can are, are values that we can store in variables just like just like number uh, numbers. So I could say T equals capital T true and you see that VS Code is coloring capital T true different because it's a special thing in Python. Um, you typically wouldn't say see a statement like if true because that will always true will always be true. So we'll just always do the thing inside the if so the if isn't actually changing what the program does, um, but we can uh, uh, we, we can use these true and false values directly in the code. Um, uh, not that often that we'll need to, um, but uh, there are some cases. Other questions? All right, so just a couple minutes left. Uh, that's perfect. We're going to have uh, Friday's class and Monday's class is going to be a lot more practice on functions and conditionals. So don't worry if you uh, don't feel completely comfortable yet. I do want to take a minute to demonstrate how to get started on lab one since that uh, is now available. So go to the course calendar or the list of labs, go to lab one. So uh, this uh, lab is uh, about simulating the prisoner's dilemma. And you can read a lot about that in the lab, uh, uh, bring questions on Friday. But to get started, there are three Python files that you will need, prisoner2.py, prisoner3.py, and history.py. So for each of these, you can right click on them and do save link as. And then maybe you create a folder CS111-lab1. You save each of the files into that folder. And then in VS Code, you could go and open your CS Lab 1 folder. And you'll be adding code to these Prisoner 2 and Prisoner 3 files uh, for the lab. So for Friday, read through the lab description. Um, the, the, the first, uh, uh, the suggested timeline is do the first problem by Friday, but uh, bring any questions you have about the lab on Friday. Uh, I have office hours uh, in 10 minutes. Otherwise, I will see you on Friday.